Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. Today, I'm um, doing something a little bit different. Most of you know I've been uh, preaching and series on the Old Testament prophets and I've been learning something every week. And I know some of you say, well, that's nothing new. You should have learned a lot. You know, I, I, I understand that. But, uh, but there's so many neat things. And today I'm going to combine two prophets. It's not that there was not enough to separate, but there's enough similarity that we can combine them. Both of them have a number of promises. And one of the great promises is... God is a God of restoration. Aren't you glad God's a God of restoration? God is a God of restoration. But let me remind you that there are positive promises and there are negative promises. You know, I've been asked over the years, and I know you've heard me say this, that if my dad ever threatened me, and my answer is always the same. He never threatened me. He made a promise. <laughs> he said, if you do this... It'd be good. If you do that, it won't be so good. So they were, they were both promises. And I see that in, in God, that there are positive promises and negative promises. But the reality is that God cannot break his word. Amen. He cannot lie. He keeps his promises. Matter of fact, Amos 3, 7, that's one of the ones we're uh, looking at today says, for the Lord does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. In other words, God doesn't just do things out of nowhere. He gives us a warning. How many glad that God gives us warnings? He's been giving us warnings ever since creation. He's always been giving warnings. And he said, for the Lord does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. And we need to remember something that God, again, cannot lie. Now, the two that I want to look at today is both Joel and Amos. Now, there's a little bit of uncertainty of the dates. Not for Amos, because Amos gives us the kings he served under. But Joel, we know nothing about the time frame. But it's generally accepted. Generally accepted. And now you'll say, well, why do you say generally accepted? You know, Christians argue about everything. So it's generally accepted that uh, Amos was a short-term uh, prophet, did not live a long time, but we give some details. He was during the time of Uzziah and also Jeroboam. But Joel, we don't know that. But I think, and most many scholars think that they were contemporaries at least for a short time. And so I want us to read from both of them, and we're going to be going back and forth between the two. But in Joel chapter 1, verse 1, we read the introductory statement where it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethio. That's all we know. We don't know his ancestry. We don't know anything about his family. We don't know about the time frame. We just know who it was, and the word of God came to him. Now, Amos chapter 1, verse 1 says, The words of Amos who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Most of you know that during this time that Israel and Judah, the kingdom had divided. You had Israel and you had Judah. And it goes on to add one little uh, nugget here. It says two years before the earthquake. How many of you know what he's talking about? I don't either. Other than the fact that there was an earthquake that people of that time frame would know exactly when it did. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, how many knows that people say that was before the depression? How many people of that generation, they know when that happens? How about here in Florida? That was before Hurricane Andrew. I mean, that was before the hurricane. So it's just a way of saying, and you just put the name in regardless, this was a major event to the Amos and to those people that he was writing to. And since we don't know which prophet 
was first. We don't know if Amos was first or Joel was first. Again, I tend to believe Joel was a little bit earlier. That's just me. But we don't know who quoted who. But notice what it says in Amos chapter 1, verse 2. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherd mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Now notice what Joel said uh, in 316. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. Aren't you glad that God is a stronghold, that he's a refuge? That's a promise that he gives to each one of us. And that God was, uh, again, speaking through these uh, prophets, telling them there's a major theme, and that is repentance and restoration. Repentance and restoration. But whichever one comes first, we get a picture. It's a warning. A warning to the rebellious and a promise to the repentant that he is a refuge. Now, both prophets use the phrase, the day of the Lord. And like many other prophecies, it can be one event, but at the same time, many events. I know some of you have problems with this because we say, what do you mean one event, but many events? See, in the study of prophecies, we have what is called the dual references. And what it means is there can be something at that time, at a later date, and a later date, and a later date. It could be replying to a lot of different things. And so the day of the Lord can refer to the end times. It could be the day that Jesus was born. That's the day of the Lord. There are different days of the Lord. And so there's many prophecies that are out there that uh, can be a double reference. And it speaks of immediate events, but also some in the more distant future. Note Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, they're spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful people, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Now, Amos uses the same terminology of the day of the Lord. Amos chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. I know I'm losing some of you, but bear with me. It gets better. In 18, it says, Woe to all you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his head a hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? But we find out later on at the very close of the Old Testament, right before the days of silence, right before the time that the prophets did not speak for over uh, several hundred years. We see in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, before behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall be set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. How about that promise? And the great one, the son of righteousness will, shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I command him uh, commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Now, what's he saying? Back in the Old Testament, and we're going to look there in a minute, God told Moses, he basically said, listen, I've got a promise for you. There's promises of good, and there's promises of not so good. Matter of fact, he uses another phrase, that there are promises, and then there are curses. Promises and curses. There's blessings and curses. But they're both with saying, God said, if you do this, 
This is going to happen. If you do this, this is going to happen. So they're both. And then it goes on to say, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now isn't it interesting? Joel and Amos call the day of the Lord as dark, darkness. But here Malachi says the awesome day of the Lord. The awesome day of the Lord. The amazing thing is, is that what's good for one else. I said, what's good for one may be bad for somebody else. Blessings and curses. Because the Bible says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I want to tell you what, that, that's scary. That's scary, to fall into the hands of an angry God. But the other side is the promise that there's a refuge that we can run to, a refuge that we can run to, a promises of repentance, a promises of restoration that God gives us if we yield and surrender to him. And it says, and he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the lamb with a decree of utter destruction. Now, I don't know if you're getting this, but there, see, there's both sides of the coin. There's a promise that God gives us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. There's promises that God says if we will obey him and surrender to him, he will bless us. Now, let me go ahead and say this because some of you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You're talking about works. No, I'm not talking about works. We're saved by grace. I like what Mark Batterson says. He said, you spell religion as do. You do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And you spell Christianity is done. The work that Jesus Christ has done it all for us. So I thank God for that. So we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by our lifestyle. We're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he tells us if we want the blessings of God, we need to serve God. If we want the honoring God, we need to be thankful for those things. And we need to be aware that there's the other side of the coin. We just need to remember that. So can you see the concept? The concept of a promise or threat, both the same one. One for obedience, one for rebellion. Another fact that both prophets speak about is using locusts. Locusts. And this too can be taken literally and figuratively. Now, locusts are in the same family as what we would call grasshoppers. Now, I've known some times in my life that there was a lot of grasshoppers. I remember a number of years ago, I was driving through the green swamp, and it seemed like uh, there was love bugs, but they were about this big. Those huge black and yellow, you know, you, you know what grasshoppers I'm talking about? They were thousands of them, man, and they were there. And I said, man, I've never seen them this bad. But I've never encountered them like they have the locusts. I was wondering if locusts was still a major problem and if it was still pertinent for us today. So I, I looked it up, and this was published by the World Bank in July of 2020. That means just recently. July of 2020. And it was an article talking about locusts that had hit Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Sudan, they had spread through there, and I found out, according to that article, that a small swarm of locusts is up to 80 million locusts. That's a small group of locusts, and when they hatch out, they consume everything in their path, and as they're migrating and as they're flying, they're flying animals, they keep reproducing, and it can go on for, for months. And the damage in one season was estimated at costing, this was what it cost to try to kill them. And the United States gave over $100 million for this need. $450 million to fight those locusts. But those locusts did $2.5 billion worth of damage. They ate an estimated 1.8 million metric tons of food, enough to feed 81 million people. I've never seen that many, roach, uh, that, that many roaches or, or locusts. 
See, where I grew up, roaches was a problem. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Those flying roaches, yeah, we had those. But uh, I, I've never seen them like that. And th think about it, that was in areas where food is already in short supply. And you take 1.8 million metric tons out of their food supply. So I think you'd have to say, yeah, it's, it's still a major problem. It's still a major problem. So do you get an idea of what these prophets were saying? Do you get the idea when they use the term that the locusts were going to sweep over and devour it? And I know some of you say, well, Pastor, you said it's both literal and figuratively. They were literal locusts. But also, I believe it can be taken figuratively. We have, how many know that the writers of Scripture had to use terminology that the people understood? I said, we use terminology. And you know, here I speak Oxford English. Now, not the Oxford England from, uh, English from England. It's old country Oxford English. Why? Because most of you can understand it. And I know I don't want to be offensive to some, but I always put the cookies on the lower shelf so everybody can reach them. <laughs> but we need to understand something. They use terminology. When they were talking about flying, they used the term on the wings of an eagle. They can understand that. You know, if Daniel or Ezekiel or Amos or Joel said, on the wings of a 707, they wouldn't have had a clue. They wrote what they knew. And so I think this could be figuratively think, speaking. I think we could say that we may not have faced literal locust, but how many of you have had something to sweep in and devour everything you had? Your hopes, your labors, your families, and leave like the parable that Jesus shared of the Good Samaritan leaves you beaten, battered, and bloodied, and left for dead. And Jesus, in the nick of time, come in and binds our wounds, lifts us up, and carries us to a place of safety. The scriptures call it the cleft of the rock. I'm glad that whatever your opposition looks like, whether it be a locust or whether it be something we call COVID-19, that God still is in control, that God still is a place of refuge, that God is still raising up and giving prophecies. Remember when Moses spoke of the nation of Israel early on in its history? Remember Malachi, we referred to Moses. Well, let's go back and read what his, his prophecy was. We're not going to read all of it. But Deuteronomy chapter 28, give you an idea of what was going on. It says, the Lord will bring you and your king. This was written in Deuteronomy. This was written by Moses. Saul did not come around for a long time. This was a long time before they had a king. So this was a prophecy. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to, to a nation that neither you nor your fathers has known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. And you shall become a hara, a proverb, and a byword among all the people where the Lord will lead you away. You shall carry much seed into the field and shall gather in a little. For the locusts shall consume it. You shall plant a vineyard and dress them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olive shall drop off. You shall father sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground, and the sojourner who is among you shall rise up higher and higher above you, and you shall come down and lo a lower and lower. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. All these curses 
shall be upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that he will command you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. We've been blessed The more we've been blessed, the more joyful we should be in our praise. But it says, you forgot him. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and in thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you're destroyed. It shall also not leave you grain, wine, or oil, the increase of your herds or the young of your flocks until they have caused you to perish. They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all the land and they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your lands which the Lord your God has given you and you shall eat the fruit of the womb Get this, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with your enemies shall distress you. The man who is in the most tender and refined among you will begrudge you food to his brother, to his wife he embraces and to the last of his children whom he has left so that he will not give to any of them, any of the flesh of his children whom he is eating because he has nothing else left. In the siege and in the distress with you, your enemy shall distress you and all your towns. We can read on. But I think you could say it's a tough time. I think you get the idea during the prophecies of Amos and Joel, the people had put their trust in things other than God. During the time of Uzziah, it was a time of prosperity. Things were going pretty good. And people were looking at the blessings. And they put their faith and trust in man. They put their faith and trust in the economy because the economy was booming There was a period of blessings, but Amos and Joel both sounded an alarm. They both sounded alarm. Let's go back and read that alarm. Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. I think you get the seriousness of this. Even Let the bride and groom who are getting ready to walk down the aisle, let them leave the chamber because this is important. He says, go on to say, behold, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make your, not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations, why should they say among the people, where is their God? Now, I don't know if you've heard it, but it seemed like uh, I've heard the statement or the essence of the statement, where is this God of the church? Where is this God of the Christians? And why not say it? Because it seems like the Christian is just as worried just as anxious, just as fearful as those that don't have a refuge. A friend, for those of us that are in Christ, we have a refuge. And it's not the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It's not the stock market. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our refuge. He is the one. And this was the situation that Joel and Amos were, were referring to. Let's look what Amos said in Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God. Well, I will send a famine on the land. 
Not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Folks, I realize that there are a lot of great ministers and a lot of great preachers in this world today, and I do not consider myself one of them. I once asked my wife, how many really great preachers do you think there are in the world? She said, probably one less than you. (laughs) But I want to tell you, the gospel that many are preaching are not the gospel of the Bible. Our trust cannot be in what we can do. Our trust must be in the Lord. See, the, the, probably the best known prophecy of Joel is in Joel 2, 28, 29. And that shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. We realize and know that that took place on the day of Pentecost. God fulfilled that. But how many knows that also was dual? Dual prophecy. How many knows God's still pouring out his spirit? God is still performing miracles. God is still doing things. It was a great promise. But what was the promise? Was it given to us to make us feel good? I thank God for feeling good spiritually. I thank God for the joy of the Lord. But the Holy Spirit was given to give us strength to become witnesses. I said the Holy Spirit was given to us for the purpose of becoming a witness. For the purpose of being able to bear spiritual fruit to be fruitful. Not just the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Awesome, awesome promises. Let's back up right before he said that in verse 23 in Joel. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. What? Man, isn't that a great promise? The threshing floor is full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. See, those are the four phases of the growth of, a, of the locust, each one of the, the growth. It says, that great army which is sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never be put to shame. Those were awesome promises. The two promises uh, in this prophecies, yes, promises both good and bad. He promises that the locust will come. I know there are those that say, well, you know, once you become a Christian, you don't ever have to worry about everything. Everything's going to be smooth. The Christian still has locusts. They still have attacks of the enemy. It's going to happen both literally and figuratively. We'll have those things. He says, we will be tested. We'll be attacked. But what are the, the two main issues here in Joel and Amos? We can repent and be restored or ignore and be destroyed. I said we can repent and be restored or ignore and be destroyed. So what is your decision? Because, see, you're the one that makes that decision. I said you're the one that makes that decision. Today I want to ask the worship team to come, and we're going to close with a song that was made popular during the Pensacola or the Brownsville Revival. But many of you do not know that that revival was the results of months 
of seeking God and repenting. See, we see the results of the revival, but it did not come about until repenting and turning to God. That song was, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what, the, what he stole from me. Now let me tell you something. Before you go into the enemy's camp, you need to make sure God's with you. I could tell you, let me just give you a condensed version of a scary story. I know some of you won't believe this because I'm not sure I believe it myself. I got a call years ago. Somebody I didn't know said, Pastor, do you believe in demons? Now, this was back in the late 70s. And some of you remember that there was some preaching going around that there was demons behind every bush. I mean, I know people trying to kick, uh, cast demons out of a Coke machine. Tuck their quarter, okay? So I know there was a bunch of garbage out there. So I really didn't know where this person coming from. I said, well, yeah, I, I believe in demons, but uh, I'm not, I don't look for them behind every bush. And she began to tell me a story. And she asked me, said, you, can you come over to our house? Now I went. You know, ignorance is bliss, and most of the time I'm blissfully happy. And they begin to tell me a story, and again, you know, some of you won't believe this, but they told me of some things that went on in that house. Gator, that if, if there was an exclamation, explanation, it would have been because there was demonic things going on. And they told me things that scared me. And I told them, I said, I can tell you, first thing I'd do, I'd repent. I'd make sure that God was on our side. Because, see, I believe the Word of God, and I don't think I can be a We can be oppressed, but that's as far as it goes. Because greater is He that's within me than He's within the world. And you say, why would you tell that story? Because I'm going to tell you, they told me some things that were scary. And you're talking about going into the enemy camp. If you're going into Satan's territory, you need to have the power of God with you. You need to have God's spirit. Matter of fact, I told the board later on that next time I had a board meeting, I said, if I get another call, you're going with me. Because there's power in unity of prayer. And whether you believe that story or not, I want to just tell you that before we go into the enemy's camp, and take back what he stole from us. I believe we need to do what Joel and Amos both talked about. And that's the time of repentance. Repentance is changing of the mind, a turning around, a changing of viewpoints. And I know some of you probably say, well, I really don't have anything to repent about. Well, pray for me. Because, see, I, I want God's touch and so before we sing I went to the enemy's camp I want to sing this old hymn the same says search me O God and know my heart and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and if God reveals it to us how many things we just need to confess it and repent and let me say this I thank God when God does things instantaneously. But how many knows that a lot of times there's a process involved? I said there's a process involved. And so as we repent, as we praise, as we worship, then God gives us the strength, Gator, to go into the enemy's camp. Don't go there without it. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm greater than Satan. Good luck on that. He said, greater is he that is within me. Didn't say self. Talk about the Spirit of God. So here's what I want us to do. If you're able to stand, stand. If not, you can do it sitting. We're not talking about drumming up excitement. We're talking about asking God to search us. Search us. And if he reveals something to you, repent of it. Give it to God. And then 
let's challenge ourselves to go and take what those those locusts have destroyed. That locust could have been drugs, could have been pornography, could be anything that's stealing from us. Could be COVID-19. Could be through no fault of your own, but it's stolen because the enemy came in. So let's just thank the Lord today for his goodness. Thanksgiving, sing it, seize it. Let's sing this old chorus and ask God to search us. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.